Roger Scruton, as a philosopher, you have applied a philosophical take um, to <coughs> wine and wine drinking. It struck me reading your book, I Drink, Therefore I Am, that uh, almost all serious books are at some level autobiography or memoir, and this is no exception. Um, wine drinking taken seriously was something that started with you really, at, I, I suppose, from an early stage when, it was, when your mother was making... Elderflower wine. Yes, I, I have um, always been intrigued by wine, and um, indeed, I grew, I grew up in a, a household in which the only wine we knew was elderberry and elder, elderflower and apple wine made by my mother. Enormous cost of la in terms of labour and uh, and family quarrels, but nevertheless, there would be a tiny bottle or two at the end of the year, which. Uh, which did make it possible to, to um, start on the next year with a, in a cheerful spirit. You're the person that Liam Donaldson has been warning everybody about the middle class obsession about starting your children yeah. off young. Yeah, watered <laughs> down <laughs> elderly. Right. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, I haven't started my children off on wine, I have to say. Not yet. But um, yes, I, I, I um, fell into this habit in France. I used to escape from England to France in those days. Yeah, um, France was the only place to be, and uh, I first, the first thing I did when I got off the train at the Gare du Nord was go to the nearest cafe and have a kir. Mm. And, and you connect, the, the, the connection seems to me between your uh, conservative philosophy and wine drinking, it's about the importance of place, uh, and speci sp a specific place, a specific terroir, and, yes. and, and, and a tradition going back a long way. Yes, I, I've always had that, um, that view of wine, that... Um, that in the end, uh, the the place it comes from, the kind of labour and, and sacrifice that went into making it are all important. I suppose this could date from my early experiences of the elderberry version, mm -hmm. um, but it has saved me from committing the uh, uh, a widely committed crime, which is traipsing all over the world, trampling things with one's boots, rather than sitting at home drinking the stuff from the bottle. Mm. Uh, so I, I feel it's a, a, a part of virtuous drinking that one should recognise one's obligation to stay at home and not pollute the pa planet. <laughs> there's, a, th there's a wonderfully um, a provocative passage in this book, which I've been thinking about ever since I read it, where you have a real go at wine, blind wine tastings, mm. where people um, are confronted with lots of different kinds of wine, and famously, of course, quite often in France, um, you've had the experience of um, French, uh, serious French wine drinkers, uh, discovering that they prefer an American mm. or an Australian wine tasted blind to their own one. And you argue that these blind tastings are either meaningless or unfair because actually the experience of knowing the name of the wine and where it comes from is also an important part of the experience of drinking it. Yes, I, I think that um, wine is very different from, say, the uh, works of art in that uh, it doesn't contain its meaning entirely within itself. You bring that to it through your own knowledge and through um, your own fantasy. Uh, one, one of the themes in my book, actually, is the, um, it, it is the mistake that Muslims make in not drinking wine today. They've been uh, uh, hijacked by these ridiculous Wahhabis who um, take a puritanical reading of the Quran. But the, the great age of Islamic literature uh, was, uh, much of it was devoted to wine. And there's a very a, a, a line I came across in Rumi, the, uh, the Persian Sufi poet the other day, in which he says the, uh, it says, the wine is intoxicated with me, not me with the wine. Uh, meaning yeah. exactly that, that I bring to the wine the whole contents of my own spiritual and, uh, and uh, moral experience, and then it reflects it back at me. And so when you're talking about different kinds of intoxication, um, there's a passage where you talk about um, smoking, and mm. you talk about uh, cannabis, and you talk about the different forms of intoxication. Mm. Wine, you would argue, is qualitatively different, even from spirits. Yes, uh, uh, for the same reason that it, 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 there is this meditative relation between you and the glass, which enables you to fill that glass with meaning. Uh, and it, it, the intoxicating quality of the wine is also in it. But in, and, and when you drink is important, and with whom you drink, you argue very much for the, the Greek symposium. Yes, uh, um, that this is one of the problems I, I think everybody is aware of in Britain today, the problem of binge drinking, of, of mm. people simply uh, seizing the cheapest uh, and most uh, 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 um, voluble bottle and drinking, glugging it uh, virtually from the, from, straight from the bottle. Uh, and that, that of course, uh, means that um, there is no, there's no 
intermediate stage of conversation in which you're drinking together, in which the, this thing is animating whatever it is between you and your uh, friends and neighbours. So perhaps rather than itemising the number of units that we should mm. all be drinking, um, official moralists should be discussing how to drink yes. rather than how much. They should itemise the number of people you're drinking with mm. uh, and, uh, and explain the, the meaning of that term with. You drink with someone not by just sitting there swigging together, but by talking and every now and then refreshing yourself uh, and producing a little, yet a little more relaxation between you. But is that different from drinking beer with friends? No, beer, beer drinking, I do um, make a case, for, especially for the old pub culture, uh, okay. in which this, um, which alas, again, partly through political... Uh, wrong political moves is vanishing from our country. But yes, I, I, it's not particularly about wine that, it is about uh, intoxicating drink as such. I entirely agree that um, the, the pub culture is a very important part of absorbing young people into, you know, sensible, dis sensible mm. drinking, which goes with sensible discussion, yes. the kind of, mm. you know, the, the corner of the pub um, where some really serious conversations yes, but about... but that requires you know, a silent pub, none of this awful um, music that drowns out every <laughs> no. serious conversation. And with a copy of St. Augustine's City of God at hand, if yes, I recall, well, isn't yeah. that right? Yes. <laughs> you yes. recommend drinking yes. beer while you're reading that? Yes, that's true, yes. Um, and there is a wonderful um, appendix to this, giving you all the different wines you should drink with while, while reading different philosophers. It's full of um, uh, lovely sentences, this book. Uh, Peace comes when people plant vines and ends when they dig for oil, uh, you say at one point. Um, but I'd like to um, also just hear from you about the importance of, uh, as it were, splurging mm. or wasting large amounts of money on wine. People complain about others who yes. spend hundreds or even thousands of pounds on a bottle of wine. And you say, mm. actually, this is, this is to be admired in many ways. Yes. Well, uh, well, my, my view is that if you have more money than is good for you, the best thing to do with it is to throw it away. Um, uh, and throw it away on, uh, uh, throwing it away on wine is throwing it away on something which quickly is transformed into biodegradable waste uh, and it doesn't pollute the, the planet. Uh, and the rest of us are all downstream from your extravagance. Somewhere or other, this money will end up in the pockets of someone who needs it. That's wonderful. But what have you got against Robert Parker? Now, I've just received a bottle this is, of wine. We, this, we should say, is the, is the, is the global, the world's yes, spanning yes. American. I, who... I'd never heard the name until last week, and I was mm. given a bottle of wine as a present for um, ceasing to be First Minister. You interpret that whatever way you want. And I was told to drink it on Christmas Day with my Christmas dinner. Robert Parker's given it 95. I was told, and I must open it two and a half hours before the Christmas meal, etc. And it's 50% Argentinian Malbec with a blend in it. And, and uh, now, and now you're here. Yeah, that and now I'm told that this scoring system <coughs> from Robert Parker is only for numpties. Yes. Uh, uh, um, well, this is <laughs> a complex shock. argument, but my my view is that you assigning scores to wine is all very well, but it presupposes a background of shared preferences uh, and he himself has created that background this is this is a marketing device he has preyed upon the uh, constitutional ignorance of the american people which is something to be admired in general um, uh, but uh, <laughs> given them a false expertise saying you can know which wine to buy because i'm giving it points that's like saying you know you can know whether which symphony to listen to i give you i give brooke well, you, you, know, mm. uh, well, you do doing cds you do yes and trenerman speaking Speaking, speaking for the American people on this occasion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, yes, very good American wines, I think, out there. Um, I'm just very fascinated with your idea that, for, you know, when you drink, this serves as a catalyst for meditation. Mm. And from, in my experience, it serves as a catalyst for talking. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Non-stop. I don't hear a lot of quiet... You don't go to a lot of sort of soirees and hear people just sort of sitting there at dinner parties not speaking. No, I know. Meditating. The, um, I think this is the difference between uh, a genuinely cultivated mind and one that only aspires to be. The genuinely uh -huh. cultivated mind uh -huh. knows when to remain silent. Uh, <laughs> and this is, this is one of the re uses of the Greek symposium. It imposes upon everybody around the table the obligation to be silent while one of them speaks. Uh, and that way, when you speak, it becomes seriously meaningful. Mm.